I started covering the campaign, in effect, before the campaign was really underway, inadvertently, I guess. In June of 2015, there was, as we all know, this shooting at the church in Charleston, South Carolina, when a young white man went into a famous traditional black church and uh, killed nine people. And um, at The New Yorker, we said, where did this guy come from? What were the ideas that he was feeding from and how did he sort of self-radicalize? Where, where, where did this whole phenomenon come from? And um, so I, I was started getting to know these organizations and these websites where there was a narrative that I'd never heard of before, which was about um, the idea that white Americans were imperiled that white Americans were victims, and that they were victims of change, they were victims of immigration, that they were not able to get the jobs that their fathers had had, and they were not able to practice the traditions that their parents could. So when the Confederate flag, for instance, was ordered to be removed, that was a signal moment, because all of a sudden they felt that these things that they had held on to were being um, systematically removed from the United States. So I started following some of these people. Uh, one of the influential thinkers in that world, this kind of world that they describe as um, racialist, that's mm -hmm. the term they use for themselves, um, is a guy named Jared Taylor who lives in a nice house outside of Washington, D.C. and um, not in the sort of remote hollows that we mm -hmm. sometimes think of as the home of the Trump phenomenon later. Anyway, he said, you can come and interview five of my readers and um, acolytes on the condition that you don't use their, their full names. And so I did. I came, and it was right outside D.C. It was right near Dulles Airport. And um, we had sandwiches in his dining room. And they were all five young white men who were winners in some sense by the kind of conventional measures of things. They had jobs. They had received an education. They had obviously sort of benefited from the system as it's constituted. And over the course of the next hour or two, they described the ways in which they were um, terrified of the country as it is today and where they thought it was going. So for instance, one of them told me that he thought that he'd been discriminated against in hiring because he was a white male. There was another one who told me um, that he had gone to high school with a diverse community of students and that they made him feel physically uh, vulnerable and that he was afraid for his safety there. Then uh, another one um, had said that he, uh, as he put it, the quote he used at the time was, the American dream is dead and the American nightmare is beginning. And I think white Americans are only dawning to what that will mean. And um, at the end of the interview, I said, you know, we haven't really talked about conventional politics at all. We've been talking about this kind of more sort of, you know, psychopolitical phenomenon that you guys are part of. But um, what do you think about politics? And is there anybody in the presidential election that, that might speak for you? And a guy named Henry said, well, we all think that Donald Trump is going to be the person that speaks for us. He's talking about issues in ways that we never thought a conventional politician could. And he's speaking in a way that really resonates with how we see the world. And Jared Taylor, who ran this encounter, uh, who was kind of the leader of this group, said to me, Donald Trump will never admit it publicly, but I think uh, he has a lot more support from people like us than he would care to admit. And that was, I then at that point actually talked to my editors and I said, look, I think this, I'd been asked to write a story about Donald Trump's candidacy, which we thought was going to be a kind of short, light piece about an oddball candidate. And what we realized, I said, look, I think these two stories are actually one story. We need to be writing about the fact that Donald Trump has been endorsed 12 days after he announced his candidacy by the leading neo-Nazi website. We need to be writing about the fact that he is giving um, life to a kind of politics, if we kind of want to call it politics, but a kind of idea that frankly had no, uh, had no home on the main stage of politics for a long time. And um, you know, I wrote this piece in The New Yorker, and I think uh, I'll tell you one thing that that is interesting is that when I wrote the story, um, and I described the ideas that they endorsed and they believed and they promoted as hateful ideas, and I said that they that Donald Trump was ushering a kind of hate into politics that had not been there for a long time, and Jared Taylor wrote to me and said that he was he was enraged by the story, and he said you know this is blinkered self congratulatory journalism, and. Uh, and you learned nothing from your encounter with us. And you know, I came away, I remember thinking for a few months, I sort of, and I didn't really think much of it again, I didn't read it again. 
his email, I don't think. And he wrote a long blog post, was very angry. And there was a lot of anti-Semitic backlash to the story. Mm -hmm. People saying, you know, this is uh, saying either that, you know, you, uh, the writer, are, um, uh, they called me a super Jew. And they said that uh, they found my grandmother's obituary. And they wrote about where my family came from and how they'd left Europe during uh, before the Holocaust. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of sort of anti-Semitic imagery that surrounded this, the publication of the piece. Then all these months later, so towards the end of the election, before the actual election, I was thinking a lot more about what Jared Taylor had said. And in his own way, um, I still think that the ideas they're promoting are hate-filled ideas. And I still think that what they were doing um, was harmful, ultimately, to the fabric of the United States. But I actually think he was on to something about the idea that I came and I listened and I didn't really connect what they were talking about to the main body of political conversation in the United States. What I thought, and this was a mistake, was that what they were doing was a separate thing. And I didn't realize that there was, in fact, a spectrum of thinking that began with, uh, the, with the ideas that they endorsed, which I think are hateful, and actually extended into the sphere of what we consider to be conventional politics. I thought these were separate, and they're not. They're actually connected in a way that I think we're only beginning to understand. So for much of that first period of the Trump campaign, where there are there there's that there's that expression taking place that you're describing, and there's David Duke and a number of other sort of incidents that sort of blip up in the way that stories blipped up during the campaign. And one of the questions that, that hasn't been settled entirely, but it's more uh, it, there was more mystery surrounding it then was. Uh, do these really reflect Donald Trump's views? And is he um, simply, you know, surfing on a wave of their creating, or is he really right in there helping that? Now, those, the, that becomes, those, uh, there starts to be convergence, and that's when we, when we get to Steve Bannon, and we get to sort of the explicit embrace of some of those views. So how does that, is that the way you see it? Do those things come together, or or uh, what happens uh, that brings those that kind of language sort of explicitly into the strategy of the of the Trump campaign and, and, and potentially of the Trump administration? Yeah, I tend to view it in strategic, almost sort of like marketing terms rather than a question of what is deep in Donald Trump's heart. I think there's something unknowable and something irrelevant about it from my view. I mean, in the sense that... Um, Donald Trump, of course, was asked, after I published that piece, he was asked uh, on TV, do you, um, you know, you, you, you've, you've gotten a lot of support from white nationalists, people who in, endorse white supremacist ideas. How do you feel about that? Do you renounce it? Do you disassociate? And at first he sort of bobbed and weaved and he said, look, I, you know, I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about that. And eventually on that interview, he was kind of forced to say, well, if it'll make you feel better, that's what he said, if it'll make you feel better, then I'll renounce it. Uh, and they moved on to the next question. And um, I think there was something much, that was a sort of a simplistic way to engage, the, you know, at that time. And I get it. I understood why, you, you know, he, he had to be asked the question and he was able to kind of rebut it. But actually, um, Steve Bannon has said that Breitbart Media, this media empire that he was creating uh, and sort of building from this um, much smaller form, that it was the platform of the alt-right. That's how he described it. So what is the alt-right? The alt-right believes in the ideas of the separation of the races. It believes that Islam represents a grave threat to the United States. It believes in a whole set of ideas that, um, that the Republican Party up until recently uh, could not tolerate. So you had Andrew, you had Andrew Breitbart's um, successor, uh, Steve Bannon, creating um, what he has described as a kind of deliberately inflammatory business. It was designed to inflame because that was the way that you would get people who might not otherwise believe those ideas to get activated. If, if you could get them activated, then you could get them involved in politics and you could begin to break up what had been the frozen dynamics of demographics and politics that, you know, white men in the upper middle West were probably going to be union Democrats. And he said, that's, that's available to us. We can break this up. And I think what you saw then was Donald Trump figured out that what what Andrew Breitbart, sorry, what what Steve Bannon had done at Breitbart Media was um, powerful in a way that none of the other conventional um, media outlets that were available to him were. That um, you know he had this slightly combative relationship, a sort of on again, off again romance with Fox News. 
they weren't allowing him to say the things that Breitbart Media was saying, and Breitbart was promoting it. And um, by bringing Steve Bannon into his campaign, that was the first step in in providing essentially mainstream validation to ideas that had been considered intolerable before. And the idea that Steve Bannon is now in the White House is something that nobody, nobody could have imagined two years ago, that that's where our politics would be. Can you unpack that at all? Explain why that relationship and why, what does Trump, why does he need Bannon now? I think there's two ways to look at it. One is simply that he looked back at the course of the last 18, 20 months and he realized, you know, I was losing at certain points or not winning as well as I was. I was beginning to fall behind. And then this guy comes in and whatever he was doing, the combination of him and some of the other people around me, that, that, that helped me win. So I'm just going to take a winner. And that's in some ways consistent with, with the way he's run for president, which is it's not about ideas, really. It's not about, um, it's not even about um, a kind of sense of a broader Republican uh, consensus. It's really about winning. You know, and that's been the core of Donald Trump business philosophy for a long time, too. If you just, you know, that's really what this is about. It's about it's about victory. So this is the guy who brought him to the dance, and that's the guy who he thinks is going to help situate him for the next period. I think there's another layer, too, which actually does um, account for what Steve Bannon represents in the world of ideas, which is that Donald Trump knows that he came into Washington with a very strange combination, a kind of fragile combination of forces. It had elements of the traditional Republican organization, and then it had these newly activated parts of politics, people who never participated in politics before. You know, the five guys in that room who I interviewed about their white nationalist ideas said they'd never voted for a Republican. They didn't think Republicans had anything for them. So all of a sudden, these guys are part of Donald Trump's phenomenon. So he needs both Steve Bannon to help him maintain that kind of fragile, furious political moment. And at the same time, he needs Ryan's Priebus to help him now navigate the inside byways of Washington because he knows he won't survive politically if he doesn't do that. So, you know, all this talk about draining the swamp of Washington is, uh, is, is, is a red herring. I mean, he has now figured out that once he's in Washington, he has to figure out how to be as much of an insider as anybody. And he's filled out his, uh, he's beginning to fill out his world with those people too. And I, at the time, I remember thinking I'm going to look back on this as one of these sort of little odd moments that you have as a reporter where you dip into a subculture and then, uh, and then that's the end of it. And actually, it turned out that they were part of the ultimate political uh, result. Is there any way for you to explain the, or is it possible to explain the election results without assuming that many Trump voters for whom these kinds of stories were not hidden somewhere in some, right. you know, hidden publication, right? They were out there for, for even casual consumers yeah. of the news. Don't you have to uh, assume or conclude that they heard these messages and, and they what? Yeah, I, I know that they did because one of my college friends, good friend of mine, um, mm -hmm. smart, you know, we've known each other since we were 18 years old, um, works on Wall Street and voted for Trump. And I said to him, you know, I don't think Trump is good for the Jews. And I don't mean that in a metaphorical way. I really, 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 really worry about what he means for uh, the future of civic discourse in America and the protection of minority voices. And I say this because my friend is Jewish and he cares about these kinds of things. And I think what he concluded and what a lot of other people concluded who voted for Trump, who consider themselves to be part of the main body of American kind of life, is that, that the alarms that people were ringing about Trump and his connections to these unsavory parts of the, of the politics uh, were alarmist and overstated. And that really, that, that politics is self-regulating, that our system of checks and balances are strong, and that those will prevent either abuses or incompetence from having a really serious effect. So their view basically is that he will get into politics and become a more conventional president than we imagine uh, in advance. Um, and um, that's how it is explained. That how, and I think there's another piece of this too, which is that by the end of his, poli by the end of his campaign, he had, co he had sort of coalesced around a, 
uh, an economic platform that was in its own way actually quite conventional and satisfied the demands of what a supply side voter would want. It, it really did satisfy what somebody who's interested primarily in tax policy would want. And so it, it comes down to, you know, in some ways, I think your choice on election day this year was, was less about a choice between these two people than it was about how you feel about the power of the presidency. If you think that the power of the presidency is constrained and ultimately kind of marginal and just part of these other forces, you can vote for Donald Trump because it doesn't matter all that much, and he'll probably do some stuff on the surface in the short term that serves your interests. If you think that the power of the presidency is vast and that history is written in ways that you can't anticipate up front, then you worry deeply about Donald Trump.